You're listening to What's Contemporary Now, a show about culture, the people, places, and things that together make it up. For anyone in or obsessed with the fashion industry, there's no greater platform than Models.com. I spent years using the site to discover anything and everything from who works with who to who represents what. It became my greatest cheat sheet when it was time to make informed proposals and key decisions. As the largest aggregate of information, it comes as no surprise that it's become the number one reference database in the entire business. With over 30,000 talents and creatives listed and 3,000 brands and publications active every day, Models.com is over a million visitors per month. As the go-to not just for creatives and talents, but any professional in the beauty, fashion, and luxury industry, its pro features members are able to search with specific filters and cross-reference pretty much anything. The only thing better is the fact that with access to your profile analytics, you can see exactly which brands and media are paying attention. Whether you're a fan of the creative industry or a member of its community, Models.com is where you'll find exactly what you're looking for. According to various studies, up to 92% of communication is nonverbal, and some claim that 55% is specifically visual or movement-based. In the 90s, it was the legendary members of the ballroom scene that fashion sourced their prowess of pose from, and the 2000s brought with them the genius of Stephen Galloway, but in recent years, Pat Boguslowski has been a rapidly recognized name in the game of movement direction. His then-viral and now-iconic moments at Margiela aside, today we get to hear all about the serendipitous journey of a young boy who dreamed of escaping his small town while having nothing more than MTV and pop culture obsessions to guide him. This is Pat Boguswalski and we're talking what's contemporary now. Pat, you have been a dancer, you have been a model, and for the past eight years you have been a movement director. But what was life like before you started adding all these bells and whistles? So I was born in Poland in the city called Łódź. I was raised in one of the most dangerous and poorest neighborhoods where a lot of crime was happening. So as a kid, I was watching a lot of music videos. I was watching a lot of movies and I was pretty much into pop culture. I never wanted to do any homework. I would just watch MTV, VH1, fashion TV. Watching music videos and fashion TV, it was like a window to a different world. I'm very glad that I didn't grow up with an iPhone. I never had a phone as a child until I was about 15 years old. But like I said before, I was watching a lot of music videos, a lot of movies, and that just developed my imagination. And I was dreaming a lot about basically leaving my country and be doing something with fashion in the future. Mm -hmm. I remember being obsessed with reading Italian Vogue. I would wait each month to get a new issue. Mm -hmm. I was very good at drawing and painting. So my mom sent me to art school. I was planning to go to university to become a fashion designer. When I was in the second year in high school, my close friend came to my apartment and she basically told me that they opened a new dance school in my city and she was begging me to come and join her. But I had zero interest in doing that because I was basically 100% sure that I'm going to become a painter or a designer. And I didn't see myself in a dance class. Like that was not in my interest at all. But she was begging me so much to join her. And I obviously did. Mm -hmm. And that was something completely amazing to me because for the first time, I realized that I can express myself in a different way. I don't have to be sitting in front of my desk, drawing and painting. I can literally be in the same room with other people and expressing myself through my body, you know, and that was just something incredible. So that was how it all started. There is this beautiful through line if you look at the trajectory you've been on between that serendipitous moment with your friend begging you to go to that dance studio, which of course subsequently changed your life, being scattered as a model in London and working with Alexander McQueen and having someone like Sarah Burton pull you out of a lineup and say, you get this. Can you show the rest of the cast how to embrace the collection, embody the collection and show them how to walk down the runway? And Those are things that, of course, on one hand, they're serendipitous, but at the same time, there's a great deal of luck in that type of unfolding where it's aligned with what you actually are interested in without even knowing it. There's that sort of beautiful balance that seemed to begin to emerge. I'm always joking with my friends that I have a good karma, that I probably did something very good in my past life. Mm -hmm. Because my family or friends from my hometown would never guess that I would be doing so well right now. I mean, let me tell you this. I get to work with the best people and I just feel very privileged. I worked very, very hard to be what I am. Mm -hmm. And I moved to London, like properly, I moved to London when I was about 24. And my first three years were so difficult. 
Like I didn't have money to even pay my rent, basically. I remember working as a sandwich man in 2015 okay. in East London, and I had to deliver sandwiches every day. And I was only making about 20, 30 pounds a day to survive. And jumping into that moment at the McQueen show when Sarah had pulled you out and asked you to teach the rest of the lineup, what were the next steps that led to you becoming a movement director as an actual career profession? In 2014, I met choreographer called Aaron Silas. He's mm -hmm. a super talented British choreographer. And I was working as his creative assistant for about two, three years. Mm -hmm. And he was my mentor. He was basically the one who inspired me the most and got me back to dance. And he saw something in me. I'm not sure if I would be doing what I'm doing right now if I haven't met him. So I'll be always on set with him, helping him develop creative ideas for his projects. Mm -hmm. But I remember there was one time when he got asked by the production to do a job as a movement director. And he couldn't do it because he was away. And he asked me if I know anyone good to replace him. And I said as a joke, sure, I know the guy. He's called Pat Boguswawski. And I swear in that moment, I heard my own words and this weird energy went through my body and I had this massive awakening that I actually wasn't joking that I should be doing this job and this is something that is meant for me. He told FK Twigs because he was basically her choreographer. So he told her about my plans and she asked him if I would be interested in doing movement direction for her shoot with some dancers. And that's really how it started. Once the issue was out, the editorial, mm -hmm. I started getting some attention and people were very curious in what I was doing. And I started booking some jobs. I feel like one of the biggest kind of most viral moments that really introduced you to a large portion of the industry was, of course, that iconic moment in 2020 at the Margiela show when you had Leon walk a very particular way closing that show. So before we even jump into the kind of exciting adventures of that relationship with Galliano, what was the catalyst on the creative for that particular show? And did you know when you were doing it that it would hit and make the impact that it did? To be honest with you, Leon is amazing, like so brave and talented. And I love that he's always so down to do anything creative. Okay. And that helps so much because this is where it really takes to become a top model. Like it's not only about the face, but also about your talent and personality. And he felt so inspired by John and myself included to create something strong. He was closing the show. I don't really remember now what was the inspiration, but I think the music and his outfit really made us just to go for it. Mm -hmm. Like We wanted to make sure we're going to close this amazing show with some strong attitude and he just nailed it. He really did. Nobody knew it's going to get so much attention, to be honest. But I remember him giving an interview to American Vogue the same day and mentioning that I helped him create that work. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting so many calls and emails from a lot of different magazines around the world. And I realized that we probably broke some rules. I mean, it was a beautiful collision of so many different variables that came into play in the most incredible way, because I think historically, especially if you look at the career of someone like John Galliano, there was an element of kind of bravado and theatrics that he brought to shows and fashion as a space. And then over more recent years, there's been a little bit more of a pared down approach to what a show entails as far as how people walk, the general mood and really making it about the clothes. And I think the return of that type of magic and kind of presence and drama was very much well received across the board. So how did you and John start working together? I remember sending a DM mm -hmm. to his partner, Alexis, on Instagram saying, listen, I love what you guys are doing. I would love to work one day for Margiela. And that's mm -hmm. it. And he replied to me saying, are you in Paris? I was like, yeah, I'm in Paris. He's like, would you like to grab a coffee? So we went for a coffee and I showed him my portfolio. And he said to me, listen, I can't promise anything. I'm going to show John your portfolio and then we see how it's going to go. And in a couple of days, I got a call back from my agency saying that John is asking me to come to Margiela office to basically have a meeting with him. And yeah, I went there. We had a coffee. He just wanted to get to know me. And he asked me to do his show. 
So that's how it started. And it's now been five years, right? You guys haven't stopped working together since. Uh, yeah, I met him in 2018. And since then, we've been basically doing all the shows together. To be honest with you, John Galliano, man, like he's a genius. Like he is incredible. He is the greatest designer. You know, I think I did some weird manifestation because when I was a child, I was watching all the time his shows. Really like I was so inspired. I would be watching his shows and my queens all the time. Really all of a sudden, here I am choreographing his fashion shows since 2018. So it just really feels amazing. And you have no idea how privileged I feel to be part of his creative vision. The fact that he trusts me and also the fact that he let me express myself as an artist, that means so much to me. Also, he has the best sense of humor. Him and Alexis doing fittings, we will be laughing and joking all the time. And that just brings so much joy into my life and my work. If you think about that sort of collision that we just touched upon in terms of what happened with you, John and Leon, and then you look forward into the horizon of shows as a concept, right? Because of course, in recent years, there was this idea that maybe they were going to fade out or they were an antiquated model. And then in the post-pandemic return to the runway, everyone embraced them with open arms and loved them more than ever. But working in that space today, what is your kind of view on how you anticipate its evolution? And do you think we're going to see more of that sort of flair and energy and dynamism that you've brought to the runway with the brands that you've been working with? I remember during COVID, we were only shooting videos. And to be honest with you, I didn't really enjoy that because I really missed shows. That life experience, you know, that you get to watch a show with some loud music, the adrenaline that comes with that, and the fact that anything cannot be replaced, repeated once it's done. It's just so exciting. And I value a lot real human connection. And to me, shows are part of that. People get together and create something special. And I love watching the audience reactions and analyzing if they like it or they don't like it. You know, it's just exciting. And I really hope the designers will never stop making shows because watching everything only on screen would really suck, you know, like would really, really suck. And I definitely noticed that since that Leon walk, there's more people, more models and designers who are trying to bring some energy. And I like that. I think that's great. That's what we enjoy the most because we don't want to watch only models walking like mannequins on the runway that's not something what really turned me on if i'm being part of the casting and i see a hundred girls i will always remember that one who got the most confidence and cool attitude and great walk and it's really about being connected to yourself and not being scared because it's really about being a performer you know show is a show and if i'm watching a show i want to experience something that I can't experience walking on the street or being in a restaurant. Like I want you to take me somewhere and experience something that I can't on a daily base. People oftentimes talk about something like clothing, style or fashion as a whole as a type of armor, right? It's a way of communicating an identity or assuming a particular role that you want to present to the world or even to yourself. Given the nature of what it is you do, do you pay attention and interpret that walking down the street any given day, seeing people's body language, the way they move through the world? Do you find yourself noticing those things or finding them to be indicative of someone's deeper character or whatever it might be? I think so, because before I got into movement direction, I was studying acting for about three years. Mm -hmm. I was learning a lot also about my body, how my emotions affect my walk or even the way I move every day. So doing my job, I don't usually like to create mood boards. Like I love being inspired by anything, life basically. I love going for a walk and seeing some crazy characters in Paris. And that could be basically enough for me to be inspired to create something for even Margiela. I can be like, oh my God, I saw this crazy guy on the bus stop. And he was moving in that way or this way. And I want to do that for the show. So I think being movement director, I need to stay open. I need to always be focused because I can find inspiration anywhere. I'm not trying to watch too much stuff on my computer or on TV. Life is the best inspiration. There's also a lot of sociology in what you do. Going into anything from a shoot, which I also want to talk about, but in terms of shows, 
you're working with people that you more often than not don't know at all. And their backgrounds have varying degrees of experience and openness to anything from movement to creativity. So what are some of the challenges you've encountered in that process? There's a lot of challenges, so many challenges, and that's why you can't be never prepared when you are doing my job. Mm -hmm. But the biggest challenge for me would be if the client wants some great iconic poses or even the choreography, but the casting isn't strong enough, there can be a new face with zero experiences who just started modeling and feel super insecure. So here's my challenge, and that's why I'm doing my job, to give the talent that I'm working with a lot of confidence and teach them and inspire them and help them to create a good picture. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's why I'm doing my job. But that can be challenging because it's like a therapy sometimes. You have to speak to them. You have to become friends with them. I think that's why it's very important for movement directors to really understand another human and read their energy. A common set. I try to get to know my team and especially the talent I'm working with. So I'm becoming friends with them. We might have a coffee. We speak about some ideas, but I never try to push them so hard. I always try to get the best out of people to make them feel like the best version of themselves. And also what is really amazing to me when I'm finishing shooting with the talent or an artist or model comes to me after the day and they say, thank you. Like I learned so much and also had so much fun. And for me, my job is about having fun. I don't want to get ever so serious about it. I take it seriously, but at the same time, I don't because I want to enjoy it. I feel like if I'm going to start taking my job too seriously, that will be the moment when I will stop enjoying myself and what I do. That's something else you've said in a previous interview that I really wanted to touch upon because I think it's relevant to the conversation today and also personally interesting, which is the importance of taking free time for you. Obviously, you work hard and you throw yourself entirely into the projects that you decide to take on, but you also ensure to block out free days. And I don't remember when it was, but perhaps earlier this year, there was that sort of story that everybody decided to share on Instagram, which was that creatives need time to sit around and do nothing. Oh, yeah. And I remember so, that. Yeah. And so I wanted to talk about that and explore whether or not that was a sort of understanding of balance that you've always had in terms of your own personal needs. It's something you cultivated and how it feeds the creativity by making space to take that time of not doing and not hustling constantly. Oh, I haven't been definitely always like that, for mm -hmm. sure. I've been always very picky choosing which jobs or editorials I should do. Mm -hmm. But when I started working as a movement director, I would take more jobs because I had to make my portfolio or put my name out there, basically. I had to create my name for myself, so I'll be doing more jobs. But I've realized the more jobs I was doing, the less creative I was. It felt like I was burning out. I had no time to basically sit around and charge my batteries, which is so important. So after three years of traveling all the time and trying to impress everyone, I felt super exhausted. And I realized that I had to do something about it. So now I prefer to do less, but I know I will perform better because I have some time in between to get inspired, to do some research or even to sleep, you know. Of course. And I love what I do, but I also need some time off to work on my ideas or even to see my family or friends. That's so important. And it's so healthy. The reality is I think a lot of people have a fear that in the case they don't say yes, someone else will, they'll lose market share and all these other things will subsequently unfold. But having that level of confidence and conviction in the quality and nature of your work to be able to draw those boundaries and make that happen is very much winning at life. And one of the other parts of the creative journey and the human experience as a whole is that constant sense that we need to reiterate or change because stagnation is generally quite uncomfortable. If you look at something like movement director as a role before Stephen Galloway, it wasn't really a thing. You know, it was very much quite unique to the work he was doing, primarily with Inez of Minute at the time. And today it's an entire industry and more and more people are considering it a fundamental part of any creative team, be it for a campaign, an editorial, a show, whatever it might be. How do you see that evolving? Is that something that you're already anticipating or thinking of through a different lens? Or do you feel like there's still a lot of growth to be done as it is a new category? This is a very good question. Like I said to you before, that every job is different. 
So I think also that's why I'm still enjoying doing what I'm doing because I never know what to expect. Like one day I'm doing a show, the other day I'm doing a campaign. Then I might be coaching someone, helping them with some moves for stage, like a singer, you know, or an actor. This job is always like very fluid and changing all the time. And that's why I'm really enjoying it because before I started being a movement director, I literally didn't know who I want to become. I will be changing my mind all the time. I'm not going to even talk about the fact that I'm a Libra. <laughs> so I changed my mind all the time, right, but I'll be trying dancing, acting, modeling. But then when movement direction happened to me and I realized that this is something I'm probably going to be doing, it all made sense. It all made sense because I've realized that everything I've been doing in the past is like a great background for what I'm doing right now, modeling, dancing, and acting. That is a really good background. So it is a very exciting job. I love doing it. And the most exciting thing about it is that I get to work with new, fresh people all the time. Obviously, I have clients that I collaborate with for so many years, but there's always someone new in the team, you know what I mean? Well, that's the beautiful thing is that it's expansive and it's stacking skill sets and evolving a role rather than replacing it. It's not like an idea has to suddenly take over movement direction entirely, but I definitely imagine some type of evolution based on what I perceive to be your character and your trajectory to date. It seems to be a part of how you like to go through life. Speaking of going through life and optimizing one's performance, can we talk a little bit about sobriety and your relationship to it, your reason for it, and why you think it's such a trending kind of practice? I mean, do you really think people's drinking less these days? I don't know. Oh my God, yes. Uh, really? I, I actually, yeah. never, uh, come to Paris, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come to Paris. I mean, they're, like someone said to me even recently that I remember, you know what? This is funny. I remember when I moved to Paris. And obviously I don't drink, I don't smoke. And my friend said to me that I am in the wrong place when I moved to Paris. She said, you in the wrong place, you shouldn't live here. And I said to her, oh, babes, like I'm the right person for sure, but I'm in the wrong place because that's so true. Like everybody in Paris, I feel like they always drink, you know, that's part of the culture. They go out, they have a glass of wine. They go out for like breakfast, lunch, dinner. They always have a glass of wine and a cigarette, you know? So I don't really think that people drinking less. I definitely believe you maybe in New York or like in LA for sure. But I don't really see that from my friends. <laughs> I certainly don't think it's become the majority, but it's gone from people who were sober as a result of maybe formerly having issues with substance to people who were sober just because they decided that it was more conducive yeah, to yeah, yeah. building a life that they wanted to have and never spending days in recovery or with compromised brain chemistry or whatever it might be. So again, it's not an overarching trend in that way, but it's definitely more common than it ever once was. And yeah, I think I had told a friend actually in June that I decided to stop drinking, not for any other reason than the fact that I just didn't feel like ever being tired and I wanted every day to start at the same level. And it was actually inspired by Ethan James Green, who had said in response to that question of why he chose to become sober, that he realized he wasn't going to have the life he wants for himself if he continued to drink. And he didn't even drink a lot. It's just, how do you optimize your performance and self? And that really resonated. But my friend called me basic when I said I stopped drinking because apparently it's a common trend. So I did want your thoughts on that. You know what? I never really liked alcohol. Like uh -huh. being a dancer, I couldn't really do that all the time because I had to stay fresh to go to school and dance and perform. So that wasn't really like a big deal for me to quit mm -hmm. drinking. But I remember around 2017, I started experimenting with drugs a little bit and I quickly realized that they are not for me. Mm -hmm. The calm downs were so nasty and I knew I can't be that person, you know. For me to produce the work on a level that I can, I'm at sober. Mm -hmm. So being a sober really makes me feel grounded and I just feel so good about myself because I really love going out with only a bottle of water in my hand and I feel like as someone who use my own body for my work, I need to give the right example. Like I'm a movement director. I should be always someone who is quite healthy. Like I can't be coming, you know, on set with hangover because I need to bring the best energy I can and I need to give that energy away. 
I need to be always in the best mood as a movement director on set because I need to connect with the talent. I need to connect with the photographer and the client. I need to drop some good tunes and make everybody feel good and to have the best time. So drinking, smoking, taking drugs definitely isn't good and right for me. And I'm completely cool with that. I'm definitely happy that it didn't take any struggles to quit. Some people we see they suffer. They feel like they always need to have a glass of wine, but I never felt that way. So it was very easy transition. You know, I just decided I'm not going to do it because it doesn't work for me. And I need to sort of stay true to myself and also be believable as a movement director, you know, that, yeah, I'm healthy. <laughs> Yeah, we definitely need to sort of respect our own bio-individuality. Yeah. And that's not to say that the same things are bad for other people. You just have to find whatever kind of makes you feel the yeah, best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I work out four or five times a week. I eat well. I don't, smoke, I don't drink. And I'm always joking with my best friends that I'm not cracking. When I'm 40, I want to look 40. <laughs> that's the deal. Yeah, I'm not cracking. And you know what? Actually, I just remembered now. I remember bumping into my friend like a couple of years ago. Mm. And... He just looked so good. And I asked him, like, how old are you? Because I thought he was a bit, like, older than me, maybe two, three years older than me. And he was like, I'm 40. And I was like, no, you're, like, 42. And he was like, do you want me to show you my ID? And I was like, yeah, please. So he did. And I swear to God, he was right. He was 40. And I asked him, okay, what's the trick? <laughs> what's the trick? What's the deal? I want to know. And he was like, you know what? Not drinking, not taking drugs, exercising, eating healthy, drinking a lot of water. He's been doing that for 10 years and he just looked so good. And I think that was the moment when I realized that, yeah, I'm not cracking, basically. I'm not cracking. <laughs> I got to follow his steps. <laughs> well, it seems like you are. And <laughs> the unavoidable question that I feel like is a beautiful natural segue on the wings of everything you've just said is, of course, what is contemporary now? What's contemporary? I mean, it's a very open question. To me, it's the moment. It's having the right attitude for life, being true to yourself, mm -hmm. enjoying the moment, expressing yourself as much as you can, and just being a good human, you know? Because at the end of the day, people will only remember how you were treating them. They're not going to remember you because of your work or what you've done. They're going to remember just how good you were to them. So I think for me, it's this sort of energy and movement just to be very conscious and stay in the moment. I love that. Thank you again for taking the time today. It was such a fun conversation and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of What's Contemporary Now. A special thanks to our show's producer, Cheyenne Asadi, who makes it all possible. Original theme music by Joseph Top Miller and Chase Coughlin of The Black Soft. And visual design by Aaron Marr and Graham Prentice. Subscribe now to be the first to hear new episodes and for more content follow us on Instagram at What's Contemporary or visit us online at whatscontemporary.com. Oh.